Welcome one and all to what is surely going to be a crazy day in the news. Are we watching rights being taken away, rights that people have had in this country for more than half a century? Oh, We might be, and we're gonna be talking about it amongst other things. Uh, through the course of this next 90 minutes or so, we've got a candidate who's going to be running. Seems like it might be good, we'll be talking about that. Tucker Carlson has a new bestie, that's great. I love friendship. You know who else loves friendship? One of my friends actually, Viviana Vigil now joins us. Viviana, how's it going? Hi John, I'm one of the people whose rights are being taken away. Nice to see you. Exactly, <laughs> I think, you know what? I think we should at least briefly comment on uh, generational rights being stripped away. Um, you know, let's at least, Let's take note of it as it happens, how about that? I've noticed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we'll be talking about that, that's gonna be fun. But um, it's been a little bit since we had you on, how was your uh, Thanksgiving break? It has been awesome, I had a great time with my family. We put up our Christmas tree, I got a big one you this year. Oh yeah, and yeah. I, I begged my boyfriend if we could get a real one this year. And he said, just this year, he's not mean, but he was, he'll probably <laughs> give in next year too. But I mean, it makes sense, you get the reusable ones, okay. But they smell so good. I don't know, if you have a big enough fridge, the real ones are reusable too. <laughs> um, That's not how it works, so I haven't done, we haven't done the tree yet, my wife and I. But I did, I was in Nordstrom Rack and I saw this silver like reindeer, so I got it. And okay. when I put it in my house, it made me weirdly satisfied. Have so the dogs I am, reacted to I, it? I don't, not that I have seen what they do while I'm not there, I don't care as long as they don't do any permanent damage to it. Um, although one of its antlers was hanging. Anyway, yeah. um, I haven't done the tree yet. I am so excited. I know that like I'm a godless atheist and you know hail <laughs> Satan and all that. But I love decorating a tree. I can't wait yeah. to hang lights. I love Christmas decorations. Well, as you know, John, the decorations are pagan roots, so you're right on track. That's that true. tree That's is a pagan celebration, so enjoy. That's also true. That's <laughs> also true. Uh, I do hang a lot of little replicas of baby Jesus on it, though. But anyway, okay. uh, no, I just I love I love the whole Christmas thing, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I want to do that soon because there's nothing I hate more than like only having a little period of the tree. My wife and I, so last Christmas we were we lived in one room. So our tree was like this big yeah. and she wanted to get rid of it like really soon after Christmas. And I would have left it for like a month probably. Well, you gotta leave it till January 6th. That is How the is epiphany. That? If you celebrate uh, any sort of Catholic holidays, uh, that is when the three kings came to visit baby Jesus in the manger oh. and they brought him gifts. And so that's when you're technically in the Mexican religion, I mean, Mexican culture and Catholic religion, that's when you do it. I'm not Catholic, I'm not mm. any religion. But as a progressive, I really enjoy Jesus. I think he was a cool dude. That's cool, yeah. <laughs> so uh, January 6th, you throw out your tree, you throw out democracy. That's, That's right. Huge traditions that we have. <laughs> three kings showed up, 300 douchebag fascists showed up. <laughs> Depends on where you're at. They got so, it fixed uh, up. You're supposed to bring gifts, not do. steer Mike Pence with the flagpole, I, but you know, to each his own. <laughs> yeah, some of them brought flags, some brought tasers, some brought Molotov cocktails. So, you know, just patriot tourist stuff. Anyway, I'm a little bit salty. Um, so uh, here's what's gonna happen. In just a second, we're gonna launch into our first story. But we've got a lot that we're gonna be talking about. In the closing half hour of the show, we got some really bad cops, including one video. Oh, it's just gonna be hard. We're gonna give you all Sorry. sorts of warnings beforehand, but some of these videos are a little bit hard to watch. And then maybe, just maybe, we'll get to talk about the climate potatoes. So uh, stay tuned so. for that. <laughs> um, mash them up, put them in a stew, whatever you want. Anyway, so uh, first of all, though, if you could hit the like button, share the stream, that would be great. Uh, during our next break, I'm gonna be giving you something else you can possibly share. But anyway, um, we're gonna launch in now into this story. So. <clears throat> Pretty big news, the SCOTUS right now is considering this Mississippi anti-abortion law that they seem based on a lot of different evidence and a 50 plus year plot from the right wing to be willing to both uphold and possibly go further than in restricting women's reproductive rights, possibly up to the point of just eliminating Roe v Wade, you know. We got the super conservative majority on the Supreme Court and they hate judicial activism. So why not strip away rights that have existed for longer than most of the people watching this program right now? So that's exciting. 
The Mississippi law bans abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. And based on some of what we're hearing right now, it is looking more and more like they're just gonna do what they wanna do. They're conservative ideologues and they wanna get rid of abortion. So they're probably gonna do that. We'll give you the evidence in a bit, but I wanted to give you a chance Viviana to weigh in. This is pretty momentous. It's not surprising we've been seeing this coming. We have been seeing it coming and it is actually quite frightening, John, because this is about rights to women's bodies. That's all this is about. And I know, you know, uh, Kavanaugh said it best, you have to pick, you know, you can't pick the, the woman and the baby, you gotta pick. And, and that is a bit of the way it is, you know, and as a woman, it, it's a very difficult, uh, I, I'm very pro choice. I would never wanna make this choice for anybody else. And it is not something that I think anybody is like, I can't wait to have an abortion. They may need one, they may need to go get it and they're looking forward to making sure it's completed. But it's not a process that anybody wants to do. So what really bothers me is the hypocrisy of this party. Because if you have to pick, then see it through. Then then take care of those kids, then, yeah. then let's do education. Let's provide and, and give access and education to everybody out there so that we can prevent pregnancy. So that we can make sure that these, unwanted pregnancies don't happen. You're not gonna get rid of abortion, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. It's never gonna stop. So let's do it legally like we've been doing it and safely. Because if yeah. you don't, it is a slippery slope into a very dangerous situation for women around the country. And it is already happening and particularly women in a lower socioeconomic status who don't have the means to fly to Denver to go get an abortion or to drive out of state or a woman who is being abused by her husband and has been impregnated for the fifth, sixth, seventh time to keep her in that abusive relationship and she has no outlets. I mean, it yeah. is absolutely disgusting. And at 15 weeks, it, it hurts me because personally, John, and like I said, I am pro-choice, but my choice is I wouldn't have an abortion. I do not ever judge any woman for having to make the choice that's best for her and her future. And sometimes the future of her, her children who are alive and they're with her and she's yeah. having to support on her own. So this is such a difficult thing and we could really solve it. We had it already figured out. Okay, Roe versus Wade was a really great way to get started. We protect women's rights to choose. And then we come in with the other side. All right, you guys are anti-abortion, let's prevent it. Let's limit abortions by educating people. Let's limit abortions by providing contraceptive. But no, they're against that too. Oh, don't talk to kids about sex. Don't give yeah. them condoms, don't give them birth control. But yet you wanna come down so hard. I mean, what Texas is doing is like Handmaid's Tale stuff. Yeah. So this is a really, and really, really and they're right further. there, and they're even further. Down. It's yeah, you're 100% right. right. And look, you in just the last couple of minutes have expressed more empathy and understanding for a decision that you have decided you wouldn't make, but you don't judge those people. You try to understand why they might be making those decisions. You try to understand what the government could do that would influence women making yeah. that decision. That was more understanding than the entire anti-abortion movement has had in the last 50 years and to their own detriment. You know, if they actually were pro life, you know, and not just pro fetus, they could actually get some people to support them. If if people they're, really they're believe they're not even pro, pro fetus, people, John, they're pro control. This is not about the fetus. Yeah, it's, it's pro. It's pro about it's it's stopping women from exercising bodily autonomy. It is upholding hierarchy. That's what it's about. 100%. Um, and and we're gonna give you the advice and the 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 evidence in a minute. But I would just ask the audience to try to. Keep keep to empathy during this, uh, and and you might not always know exactly where that might be needed. Like a lot of people will respond. Like I remember when Texas passed their law, some people were like, "Well, they should just move out of Texas." Okay, <laughs> sure, but that's very difficult. How easy would it be for you to move to a different part of the country right now? How easy would it be for me or Viviana to move to a different part of the country? Like, sure, even if they do this, there will always be states where abortion 
is legal, but for many women, even traveling to one of those states would be prohibitive. You could lose your job, it could be a massive problem in regards to your relationship or your family. As Viviana was saying, you could be in an abusive relationship. So let's try to have understanding. We have to have understanding and, and, and empathy because that's like definitely- And how far important. do we take it, John? How, do, how far do we take it? If we're going to start limiting women's rights to choose what to do with their body because of the, the produ production of a, because of a conception, then do we start limiting men's rights? Oh, I want to get a vasectomy. Oh, no, no, that you're interfering with God's plan. Where do we draw the line? We have to draw the line at our citizens and our right to be autonomous and have free agency over our bodies. That is the line. That is why Roe versus Way was in place. And that is what we need to uphold. Now, I am with everyone else out there. We do not want rampant abortions and that is not what the problem is. And there are not women out there who are like, do I want to be pregnant anymore? I'm eight and a half months pregnant. Do I want to do this anymore? Nobody. This is a major decision that is about the life of them the life of their baby, all kinds of things that they should be discussing privately with their doctor. The fact that yep. this is out in the open again is, is really frightening. We don't know and when this is going to stop. And if the Supreme Court goes back on their own ruling, then this means everything is questionable. Civil rights is questionable. I mean, once we start going, it's a slippery slope. Well, they got rid of the Voting Rights Act. I mean, I would argue, yeah, we already we already have done that. Um, and all of this is because. They're getting what they paid for over the course of multiple decades. They wanted an insane right wing radical Supreme Court. They have it, it is now giving back what it was put there to achieve. As we're waiting to find out exactly what's gonna happen with the SCOTUS decision on this Mississippi law, here are a few of the key statements that we can use to try to understand where they might go. So uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who of course has faced uh, multiple accusations of sexual assault and sexual harassment. He said, you have to pick when, con when considering the interest of the pregnant woman and the fetus. That's the fundamental problem. And one interest has to prevail over the other at any given point in time. When you have those two interests at stake and both are important as you acknowledge, why should this court be the arbiter rather than Congress, the state legislatures, state Supreme Courts, the people being able to resolve this. Well, I might make the case because you're literally the goddamn Supreme Court. At the end of the day, when there is disagreement about fundamental rights, it is literally your only job to be the arbiter of that. But I don't know, the dude has trouble understanding these concepts because he really, really likes beer. But anyway, that is him indicating, well, you know, it's not, it's not on us, it's to them, which just means we're gonna let right wing states take away your rights that you have. And let's see, Alito, was questioning the Center for Reproductive Rights attorney Julie Rickleman about the viability line and said, what does a woman have when reaching the point of viability that would make her want an abortion that she didn't have before reaching it? I don't know, knowledge of her pregnancy? Knowledge of her pregnancy, <laughs> uh, time to have thought about it, time to have uh, you know navigated a dense web of relationships and obligations and attempts to pressure her. Uh, the financial ability to do something about it, the knowledge of where she needs to go and when, working through multiple state regulations that make it take as long as possible and be as onerous as possible. That's yep. some of the things that she might have. Again, they like to pretend that they don't live in this country. They don't understand these sorts of things. They like to pretend anyway. that children don't live in poverty, that people don't live, you know, check to check, barely getting by. They like to pretend that we have a, a, a an insurance system that actually values human life. It's really yeah. the hip hypocrisy is sad, John. It's it's just upsetting. Yeah. It is. Well, here's something more upsetting, uh, potentially. And remember, like, uh, was it about was it Alito that it might have been Kavanaugh too? Susan Collins is like. Well, I believe that he will uphold the law and the law is Roe v. Wade. Okay, yeah, you really believe that. You super believe that. Weird, you were apparently super wrong. Will there be any consequences for that? No, because she's rich and powerful, there's never any consequences. But anyway, we also have as of this morning, Judge Amy Coney Barrett, who was totally not put on the court at the last minute because she never, was no. a whack job a Christian <laughs> radical, a right winger. Said oh, both yeah. Roe and Casey emphasize the burdens of parenting. She then asked why safe haven laws, regulations under which parents cannot be prosecuted for leaving their newborn in a safe location or with an appropriate person, don't quote take care of that problem. I mean, after all, if there's a if there's adoption, which this is apparently new. I don't think that you could have put kids up for adoption before. Uh, then why should you have any control over your body? 
You should just bear it for nine months, deal yeah. with uh, I don't know tens of thousands of dollars in medical debt. Uh, lifelong effects on your body, the possibility that that will make it even more difficult for you to deal with an abusive spouse, abusive parents, all sorts of things like that. And then give it up for adoption. That's easy after all from Amy Coney Barrett's point of view. So uh, Viviana, you're a woman, um, yeah. why doesn't that just take care of the whole thing? Is really uh, very short sighted and a lot of times people in privileged positions, which I assume Amy is one of them. Uh, and she has several children of her own and I believe she's adopted. And so this is why she has this like chip on her shoulder about adoption. As a former social worker, obviously I'm a huge proponent of, of adoption. As a woman that was never able to conceive and have her own child, I'm a huge proponent of adoption. I'm, I may adopt in the future. This doesn't, they're, they're two different things. This yeah. is about a woman's right to her own body. You deciding how, she's one of those people like, oh, you can come to my party, just leave or work early, take the bus and figures out your yeah. life for you. Don't figure out my life for me, let me figure out my life. If I tell you I can't do something, respect that, honor that and let's move forward. Of course, there's a lot of different ways that you can make an unwanted pregnancy you know, work out for you. But you're one person, Amy Cohen Barrett, and you don't get to decide for everybody. In fact, your job is to protect everybody's right to decide for themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We we have already provided, and you know, experts testifying can provide even more tons of reasons why uh, women in a variety of different life circumstances might want to exercise the reproductive rights they've had their entire life. I, the I said the other side is because our interpretation of right wing Christianity says we don't want you to. That is the only, that's the only, that, thing. That's the only thing on the other side. She has yeah. taken one religion that conveniently they follow in the Supreme Court um, and decided no, my religious beliefs trump your rights. Uh, okay, well then I'm sure that they're gonna be you know, just, as, just as fine with if we were to put uh, six Muslims, six Hindus, six Buddhists, six left wing Christians. And then just whoever has the majority takes whatever belief they have that they were raised in. And then that's what we all have to follow. That's the precedent that we're setting. If, if they're so concerned about that, why aren't fertility treatments covered by insurance for women? That's not covered. You're so concerned yeah. about our fertility, but you won't pay for us to get pregnant if we want to, to help us get pregnant. We can't yeah. afford that, but you're gonna decide that we should be pregnant if we don't wanna be pregnant. You know, I've had a lot of friends who have had abortions, who some of them regret them. Some of them are, they say it was the best decision they ever made. I know somebody that's had a couple of abortions. They stand by, you know what, I had to do it. It was the best decision I ever made. I, as a social worker, I took people to get abortions, young women that needed to get abortions and have an adult there with them. And it was, it was a difficult decision for them. And I'm glad that I have the right to choose for myself. I told you earlier, I don't think that I would do it, but you know what? I don't know for sure. What if there was a circumstance that put me in a position that my life was at risk, my child's life was at risk, I was in an abusive situation, who knows? To not give somebody the right to choose about their own body is just obscene. And you're absolutely right, the Republican Party has been planning this for decades. They have been planning it since Reagan, they've been planning it since Bush. And we're finally here and this is a very dangerous time. We really need to get involved politically. The youth need to be involved. All genders need to be involved, all ages. This is about our right to our own body. Once you start limiting rights and just for women, it'll happen to men too. If you just get to decide what we, we get to decide to tell you what to do with your body, then where is the line? This is what's wrong. Yeah, well, um, I'm gonna jump ahead to these uh, polls. Uh, just for, I don't know, tradition's sake, let's pretend that we live in a democracy and let's talk about things that might matter in a democracy. Um, so uh, polls show that uh, not only do people uh, support women's reproductive rights, they in fact do it more than ever before. Uh, there's broad support for abortion rights in Gallup polls. They show that Americans support for abortion in all or most cases was at 80% in May. I, I didn't even know you could find an issue that 80% of people support, but they do in this case. The share of Americans in Gallup's poll who say abortion is morally acceptable reached a record high of 47% in May, up from a low of 36% in 2009. And Quinnipiac poll found support for abortion being legal in all or most cases reached a near record high in September with 63% support. 
I say these things just because you might start to question with the fact that the right wing has gotten so many crazies on the Supreme Court. Wait, maybe I'm in the minority. No, no, people have been supportive of this for literally decades. They continue to be even more so, but we don't fundamentally live in a democracy. We just don't. And another way that, that manifests is we keep electing politicians who say that they support these things and then they don't really do it. And that comes in a variety of forms. Some might be, for instance, if you were to elect a Democratic president and an opening on the Supreme Court came up and then the Democrats didn't actually fight to fill it and instead you get a crazy like Alito in the spot, that might be frustrating. Or if you deliver the, the House in 2018 and then the White House and the Senate in 2020 to the Democrats and then the conservatives still have this majority of the Supreme Court. And then the Democrats tweet this, I'm gonna jump ahead of the last graphic in this block. Elect Democrats to protect abortion rights. Okay, so apparently the Senate Democrats, or at least the person managing their Twitter, has been in some sort of hibernation pod for the last year. We <laughs> did, we did that. Now do it. You have yeah. the door, you have the Senate, you have the House. There are things you can do, even if you've totally given up on the Supreme Court, which apparently you have. Yeah. There are things you could do. You could codify it in law. You could put pressure on the senators that would be necessary to get rid of the filibusters. So you could actually pass any of this because no legislation could actually pass. Without getting rid of it, you could do these things. What what is the money behind this, John? What is the money behind this anti-abortion push? Because everything okay. in the no, it's a great question. And I and, and in this case, there is very much money behind it, but it's not directly behind it. It's not that billionaires desperately want to stop, you know, some woman in, you know, like Mississippi. Yeah. Mississippi from getting an abortion. It's they need this to motivate their side because their side being motivated and turning out and winning elections and getting the, the, the Supreme Court delivers what they actually care about, which is purely economic um, issues. There was that Netflix documentary, was it called The Promise Keepers? What was it called? Where they had the conservative Christian, you know, like prayer that they sponsor uh, for, with every inauguration. Do you remember that? I'm not sure. I, I, it might be about the family. I'm not sure. The family. That's right. Yeah. And there's a lot yeah, of money yeah. behind that. And yeah. putting these. The, this is. We got to figure this out because that's what's happening. It really isn't about abortion. It's really about control, and it's about you know something else. Really. I. I. I we got to get to the bottom of it because I. You know they don't care. Kavanaugh probably has had abortions since how You know Trump has. I mean. Just so like we, knew, we knew it was coming. We yeah, was of course coming. we knew it was coming when they didn't let Obama put somebody on the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah, and and look, like ugh. anyway, we're gonna take our first break. There's other aspects on this. I'm sure we'll be talking about it more uh, tomorrow, but there is a lot of other stuff that we'll be talking about as well. We will be watching to see uh, what happens. That said, it is pretty clear what's developing. Can't wait to hear stuff about how in a couple of years the Democrats will do something. You're in control right now. You can do things right now. There are things that Biden could have already done for women Absolutely. in Texas dealing with this new law. They Absolutely. Just not do. They they desperately want power and then don't ever use it for anything. Not anything that benefits us. Yeah. Anyway. They're too busy trying to appease both sides. Yeah. Ugh. And who are who are they actually who supports this? Who supports this? Anyway. We're gonna take our first break. We'll be back with more after this. Anyway, uh, with that, let's jump into more news with this video. The president says it's fake news. What, what is the story here? Well, the, the president's right, it's fake news. Uh, if, you, if, if you actually read the, the book, uh, yeah. the context of it, uh, that story outlined a false positive. Uh, literally had, had a test, had uh, two other tests after that that showed that uh, he didn't have COVID during the debate. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, the way that the media wants yeah. to spin it uh, is, is certainly to be as negative about Donald Trump as they possibly can. Uh, while giving Joe Biden a pass. Okay, so there's a lot of issues there. So that is Newsmax. Mark Meadows wants to have his grift and be eaten by it too. So he comes out with a book that reveals all the stuff we talked about on the show yesterday about Trump getting a positive COVID test 
and then running around the country hugging as many people as he possibly could. And then blaming those people for him getting COVID. Okay, so Trump then claims that it's fake news, lying to us about his lies. And Mark Meadows says, yep, I spread fake news or the interpretation <laughs> was fake news and they give Biden a pass. On what? Biden wasn't, he didn't do any of this. He's not even a part of this. They just say things, they have no regard for words. <laughs> um, but that said, there's a few issues with Mark Meadows is saying there. So first of all, Viviana though, I wanna give you a chance. Uh, I'm sure you saw the news yesterday about Trump and the debate and the gold star families. Now they're saying, oh, no, no. Yeah, sure, he tested positive, but he also had a no, a negative test. So, so it's all fake news for you to be angry at him. Yeah, I mean, I think we had an idea when it was going on. I mean, we were all doing the math once he was in the hospital. We were like, wait a minute, this isn't adding up. Come on, we know what happened. He was positive, they were trying to hide it. He didn't think he was gonna get sick, he got sick. He got sicker than he thought he was gonna get. He got hospitalized, he pretended he wasn't that sick. And here we are, I mean, Mark Meadows, I, Oh well, if you read the book, did you read the book? Did you write the book? Like, what's <laughs> going on? Because I think we all know without even the book coming out what happened. And if you have to test 50 times, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it positive? And then they use the most, but like worthless test to determine. Yeah. We yeah. Well, and that's happening. apparently what they did. So yeah. in the book, he details that in a rapid antigen test, uh, they tested uh, negative after testing positive. Okay. Well, that is a higher, uh, you know, fallibility rate. Right. Um, but whether but whether it does or not, here is what they want you to believe. Okay, so try to forget everything that you have predisposed <laughs> about whether you're a progressive or all the news. Okay, so a person has a positive test for potentially lethal virus. They get a positive test and then they get a negative test. Okay, let's say they get a positive test and then two negative tests. What would you do as a human being? Would you say, oh well? Screw the positive one. I'm just gonna run around without a mask, and yeah. I'm gonna go up to these uh, these people who lost their kids in the military, and I'm gonna hug them and give them a kiss on the cheek. Is that what you would do? It's horrible. You just take the one that's convenient, it's horrible. or would you err on the side of, oh well, there's a little bit of ambiguity here, and the stakes are super high. If so we I'm go back to that time, the CDC guidelines at that time were to quarantine if you've been exposed. Yeah, not even tested positive. So we want him to be a human. And by the way, what Meadows is saying there, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a bit more of the video so that you can see, because the weird thing that happened in this interaction was that that Newsmax guy, um, being told his name is Rob Schmidt, whatever. Um, so the Newsmax guy kind of asks an actual follow up question. Yeah. Here it is. The, the timing is interesting though, you have to admit. I mean, it wasn't even, was it even a week later? that they choppered him to Walter Reed and the president was very sick. Yeah, listen, uh, any time that we look at things uh, and we, we look at tests and we look at uh, what happened, it's, it's certainly, uh, uh, that's what I outline in the book yeah. and, and uh, talk about that Walter Reed visit. Uh, but there's a lot of great stories in the book uh, that, that candidly talk about the, the miraculous work, uh, the historic work yeah. that Donald Trump did. I think uh, most of your viewers will find it a very enjoyable read uh, and I would encourage them to read it for themselves. Okay, all right, fair enough. So, so the the story is that it was a false positive. He got negative ones after that, uh, but the first one was uh, was a false positive. That's all correct. Right. So, yeah, so he didn't have yeah, sure. have uh, COVID during the debate. Okay, all right, fair enough. I want to talk. Yeah, fair enough. That that's convinced him. <laughs> I mean, again, they don't do the sociopath test. Whereas, like, if you got if you had like an STD test that was positive and then negative. And you're like looking at it, and then looking at the bedroom door to the person laying on the bed. I'm going with the negative, and then yeah. you run in. Is that a good person? Is that a moral person? Would you do that? You would not do that. But that Newsmax host, who actually asked the follow-up questions, and like, oh, okay, yeah, no, they should just read the book then. Uh, well, I like how how Meadows was like, but there's a lot of really great stories that your viewers are gonna like. Forget the, this, don't ignore the man behind the curtain, Wizard of Oz. Sorry. Who might or might not have an STD. Uh, it's like, yeah. oh, I took a pregnancy it test, up. it was positive. And then I took another pregnancy test and it was negative. And then I was pregnant a week later. Was the first one a false positive? I don't know. No, that, uh. is a, that is a devastating point because his claim isn't just that there was ambiguity. 
he's going to the mat saying it was an actual false positive, not that they yeah. disagreed. He didn't have COVID when he did yeah. those things. Well, first of all, the, de the debate was literally three days after the false positive. The Gold Star event was after that. So the window when supposedly Trump actually got sick starts to get really narrow. Mark Meadows would have you believe that like someone breathed COVID on Donald Trump and he like he just fell over in a hospital instantly. <laughs> That's not actually how it worked. <laughs> I will remind you, Mark Meadows, he actually had COVID. He went yes. to the hospital, you dingus. So he yes, did. it probably wasn't a false positive for the thing he definitely had. It seems interesting that he can understand the nuance of science and testing when it comes to this specific example. But in general, they're like, oh, well, Dr. Fauci saying this, and now he's saying this, and now he's saying this. But when it comes to this example, he can understand how there could be a false positive, and then maybe this. And but my favorite part was like, but don't worry about that. There's lots of fun stories for everyone to enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and to enjoy them, you only need to give me 1999. <laughs> yeah, that's convenient, buddy. No, I'm not buying your stupid book. I don't buy any of them, even for people I like. You definitely aren't on that list. Anyway, the Republicans have been attempting to, uh, I guess, in this case, have their pandemic and eat it too. So they advocate endlessly for more and more COVID cases and deaths. And then they turn around and use the presence of the COVID cases and deaths as a club to bludgeon the Biden administration with. So we're gonna show you a video. We don't often show Jen Psaki videos in this case. I'm not one of the like team Psaki bombers or whatever. But I thought that this <laughs> was a good response to the reporter Ducey's question, which you'll see here. First Trump Biden debate today, but at the second one in 2020, when roughly 220,000 Americans had already died of COVID, Joe Biden said about Trump, anyone who is responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America. Is that still the standard now that more Americans have died under President Biden than President Trump? Well, I think the fundamental question here is what are you doing to save lives and protect people? And the former president was suggesting people inject bleach. He apparently reportedly didn't even share with people he was going to interact with that he had tested positive for COVID himself. He continued to provide a forum for misinformation, which probably led to people not getting, uh, not taking steps forward to get to protect themselves, to wear masks, to eventually get vaccinated. This president has made the vaccine widely available. He's relied on the health, uh, the advice of his health and medical experts, and he is trying to be a part of solving this crisis, getting the pandemic under control. And I think there's a pretty stark difference between their approaches. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, so Viviana, we're gonna do a little bit of bubble popping. We're gonna try to step out of our bubble and we're gonna try to be uh, super needlessly fair. So they're saying he said he'd end this thing <clears throat> and he hasn't ended it. There's still a lot of COVID. That said, there are people at the, like the cult of COVID has been working in overdrive this year to make sure that people still get exposed to it and still die from it. So. Uh, how fair is the criticism of Biden? Is there anything to it? Um, I actually don't think the criticism is very fair. I think she did a very good job. I mean, it was a little bit like snarky about the bleach comment, a but little. it's it's true, so it's fair. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who do not want to get vaccinated. We have a lot of people who do not who do not want to wear masks, and so you know, the virus has evolved, morphed, and it still is. We have a new variant coming, so. Is that Joe Biden's fault? No, what will be Joe Biden's fault is if we're not taking care of those people to continue to provide PPE, provide testing. I mean, it's really, if anybody has school age children right now, they know how difficult it is yeah. because they have to go get a test for these kids. If they have a sniffle, they gotta go back to school, they gotta quarantine. And it's been a nightmare for parents and for kids. So that I put on Joe Biden. I don't put yeah. him infecting people because what's going on now is a lot different than what was going on at the beginning of the pandemic. And you know what? I was really hopeful that Trump was gonna take this by the horns and actually be a leader. I was really hopeful that he could get it together and get his team together. I mean, he's kind of a useless blob, but maybe he has people <laughs> behind him that could prop him up and make him do something, but he didn't. So yeah, it is his fault. Absolutely, because he was spreading misinformation, because he was encouraging people to do things that were gonna harm themselves. And he didn't 
take action soon enough to actually protect the country. So yeah. it's completely right. apples and oranges. Now, I don't love Joe Biden, but I'm not gonna put all of us on him because he did inherit it. Yeah. Yeah, and look, you made a great point about the misinformation as well as the anti-vax stuff. But I would say it is a little bit inconsistent, again, trying to stay out of my bubble, for someone from Fox to say, hey, people are still getting COVID and that's bad. When he works for a network that literally says, you should try to get natural immunity, which means mm -hmm. you should try to get COVID. Yeah. Like, you can't be like, it's awesome, everybody's getting COVID. Why did he let people get COVID? Shouldn't you be applauding him at that point? Like, if you like the governors of red states where people are like, like dying of COVID, then wouldn't he get more credit? Anyway, let's talk about one of the consequences of this. We're gonna jump ahead to our next block. <clears throat> A lot of COVID on the show today. So a lot uh, of COVID since, in the country. It's it's everywhere. Uh, since the beginning of this pandemic, people have been pushing misinformation, and one of their favorite brands of misinformation is literally anything you should do rather than wear a mask, socially distance, get the vaccine. Anything else is good; those things are bad. So take you know drugs for all sorts of other stuff that don't treat COVID, and take that instead. So they started off with hydroxychloroquine. They briefly dabbled in sunlight up your bum and a little bit of bleach, <laughs> uh, but then they got laughed at for that. So they quickly moved on to medicines for animals. And so ivermectin and all of that stuff, stuff that despite months and months more passing, have not been demonstrated to actually help with treating COVID. But they have convinced people, these, these politicians as well as right wing uh, you know, uh, people in the news, um, you know, and in media, including people like Joe Rogan, that that is what you should get. And the consequence of this is that hospitals are now facing both legal uh, challenges as well as harassment because they don't wanna give people stuff that isn't a treatment for the illness they have. One Montana hospital went into lockdown and called police after a woman threatened violence because a relative was denied her request to be treated with ivermectin. Officials of a different Montana hospital accused public officials of threatening and harassing their healthcare workers for refusing to treat a politically connected COVID-19 patient with Iver ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. In neighboring Idaho, a medical resident said police had to be called to a hospital after a COVID patient's relative verbally abused her and threatened physical violence because she would not prescribe ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. Dr. Ashley Carvalho said, my patient was struggling to breathe, but the family refused to allow me to provide care. They don't want stuff that actually fixes it. They want the stuff that the podcasters and the YouTubers yeah. told them to take instead. Right, which is probably more harmful than the actual vaccine itself. <laughs> I just don't Well, in terms of side it. effects, definitely. And it yeah. doesn't have the side effect of actually treating the illness. It's, re it's really ridiculous. And you know, it's not just conservatives, John, and you know this. There are people who consider themselves more liberal who are anti-vaxxers and who have refused to get the vaccine. I've seen it amongst my own um, friend group, people who were really? positive with COVID and went to Whole Foods to pick up some bone broth or whatever they're gonna get. Just thinking, and I didn't get that sick, I didn't, it wasn't that bad. Well, for you, but what about your 75 year old grandmother or something? I mean, it's just the lack of concern for others is really kind of mind boggling. And we're seeing a little bit of a trend uh, in society right now that way across the board. We're seeing it like we saw at the the, the Scott concert where there was the yeah. trampling of people and whatnot. You have to be aware of what's going on around you and you have to be empathetic to those people. Cuz guess what, you also are part of the masses. And if we don't care about each other, then you're also in danger. So we need to get this individualistic American pride ideology and become a little bit more collectivistic to think if we want to survive as a species, we need to work together. And part of that is, do, I mean, we've done it for generations. I mean, that's why we don't have polio, it's crazy. Let's keep doing it. We did, yeah, we did it for other stuff. And 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 the anti-vax stuff is not new. I, I would say traditionally, it seems like it was more sort of like liberals and stuff like that up until it became this yeah. big political thing. My only hope is that these, these treatment drugs somehow evade this pattern that uh, I, I understand it's it's difficult to imagine because it actually apparently treats COVID. So there's gonna be a lot of pressure on the right to not take it. But maybe, it's not a vaccine, maybe. Can we yeah. feed it to a donkey or something on camera? Maybe if they see a donkey take it, 
then you're going to get PETA that, after know. you, John. Don't get PETA after you. You don't need I that. I will deal with PETA if it stops the pandemic. How about that? <laughs> Anyway, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna go to break. We do have one more little uh, COVID story. It's sort of important and it's uh, coming a little bit close to home here. So we're gonna take a short break, but we'll be back. We'll have a lot more news for you after this. Anyway, uh, we do have a lot more news to talk about. So why don't we jump into this? That a recent case of COVID-19 among an individual in California was caused by the Omicron variant. It's here, the Omicron variant is here in the US. I mean, did we have any doubt? It had already hit so many different countries, um, but it's here. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom said that the state's large scale testing and early detection systems uncovered the case adding, we should assume that it's in other states as well. And that seems like a slam dunk case there. It is probably in other states. It is probably gonna spread quite readily. It's already been found in Australia, Austria, Belgium, Botswana, Britain, Canada, Czech Republic, Denmark, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Israel, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Portugal. And hey, now we're on the list. America just always coming up just slightly after those What's other countries. What's it gonna take? What's it gonna take? How many variants do we have to go through to, before people start vaccinating themselves? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, in this particular case, it seems like it might have some added power to evade vaccination, but it also is known to affect you less than some of the other variants, which might well be because of the vaccines that many of these people who've been infected but have. But see, that's but the thing that gets people misled. So you can get it get the even though you're vaccinated. But the reason it did become a new variant is it, be, it was allowed to grow because people are not being vaccinated. So the fact that it infects a vaccinated person is actually bad because people were not getting vaccinated before with the original variant. <laughs> And it's still the best protection that we have, and it still likely makes the cases less severe. Uh, that said, Dr. Fauci did have a little bit more information about the Omicron variant hitting the US, so here he is with that. Right now, the individual was a traveler who returned from South Africa on November the 22nd and tested positive on November the 29th. The individual is self quarantining. And all close contacts have been contacted and all close contacts thus far have tested negative. The individual was fully vaccinated and experienced mild symptoms which are improving at this point. We knew that it was just a matter of time before the first case of Omicron would be detected in the United States. And as you know, we know I've been saying it and my colleagues on the medical team and others have been saying it, we know what we need to do to protect people, get vaccinated if you're not already vaccinated, get boosted if you've been vaccinated for more than six months with an mRNA or two months with J&J. &J. And all the other things we've been talking about, about getting your children vaccinated, masking in indoor congregate settings, etc. So the advice is basically the same. The evidence so far seems to indicate that this might spread fairly freely because it seems to have some ability to evade vaccination, but that the cases tend to be more mild based on the experience of other countries. And you also bear in mind, the Delta variant is still running rampant throughout the US. So the advice is the same, just get vaccinated. I just got my booster a couple of weeks, John. A couple of weeks ago, too, got my booster. Month ago, yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't have any negative reaction at all. But a lot of people have had had some, you know, soreness, body kind of chills, and things like that, especially older people. So, sure. if that's a taste of what you're going to do, feel like if you get sick, then I'd rather just go through it for one day with the booster. But I literally ha had nothing. No, I didn't have any negative reactions to any of the vaccines or the booster. I had a little bit of arm soreness, but that's it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's worth it. Okay, with that, let's jump into a very different news. <clears throat> oh, no, uh, the E block. That's there. not a face I want to see. There's yeah, a face. I don't, I don't think she wants to be affiliated with that face. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Stacey Abrams has announced that she is going to be running again. Now, uh, she had run in the governor's race in Georgia back in 2018, uh, became uh, sort of nationally uh, prominent, uh, especially on the topic of voting rights, particularly because of all of the uh, voter suppression that happened in advance of her race. So she could potentially be running again against Governor Brian Kemp. 
Uh, three years ago, she lost by about 55,000 votes, a very narrow thing. So uh, she, we would assume, would have the best chance probably in that state of uh, winning in a rematch, especially with uh, you know the fact that both Senate seats went for the Democrats recently. But I do want to throw out there that some things have changed since then, and not just that the state seemingly is moving more blue. Uh, like in a lot of states, the Republicans are also making it harder to vote. They've uh, lowered the time you have to request absentee ballots, strict new ID requirements. It's illegal for election officials to mail out absentee ballots to all voters. Drop boxes have been limited. Mobile voting centers are essentially banned. You can't give out water and on and on and on and on. So these are the exact sorts of things that a Governor Abrams would presumably try to limit or reverse. But first, she has to get past all these new restrictions, Viviana. It's convenient. I'm ecstatic that she's running again. She is our best bet for that region of the country. She is an incredible leader. She just really changed the face of politics in Georgia. And she's gonna be an incredible advocate for voting rights and to be able to protect her constituents down there in Georgia as well. Uh, is it gonna be hard? Yes. Am I gonna contribute to her campaign? Yes. Do I hope she wins? Yes. <laughs> I love those chains of questions and answers. Uh, sure, uh, not everyone is happy about this announcement, though not everybody's pulling a Viviana. Um, is Brian Kemp mad? Yes. Is he, he tweeting about be. it? Yes. So he <laughs> tweeted, with Stacey Abrams in control, Georgia would have shut down, students would have been barred from their classrooms, and woke <laughs> politics would be the law of the land and the lesson plan in our schools. Woo. Yes, you just have a book and every page would just be woke. Woke, woke, woke. <laughs> they don't have anything to run on. They what is woke anything. politics? Is that is I it don't know critical race theory either. again? Critical race yep. theory? You know Stacey Abrams just always doing a critical race theory all <laughs> over the place. That's what would happen. But anyway, here's the thing. While Brian Kemp is not happy, uh, Trump isn't happy either. Seemingly with either of them. So he effectively tweeted uh, through his uh, the woman on Twitter, who's effectively his Twitter account now, and said, Stacey, the hoax Abrams has just announced that she's running for governor of Georgia. I beat her single handedly without much of a candidate in 2018. I don't even know what that means. They didn't run against each other. I don't <laughs> understand what he's saying. He was I'll running beat her in again. Georgia? I'm gonna be the governor of Georgia. I will never step foot there, but I will be the governor. But it'll be hard work to do with Brian Kemp because the MAGA base will just not vote for him after what he did with respect to election integrity and two horribly run elections for president and then two Senate uh. seats. But some good Republican will run and some good Republican will get my endorsement and some good Republican will win or they'll lose, in which case I'll say that they were losers and I never liked them. <laughs> I like that he beat her. He beat her. He beat her what like in a marathon in Super Smash Brothers? What did you <laughs> yeah. what did you beat her in? I don't understand. Um, and uh, by the way, he hates Brian Kemp because Brian <laughs> Kemp didn't somehow give him Georgia, even though, dude, you still would have lost the presidency. But Brian Kemp did pass all these extra voter suppression right. measures. It's not like Georgia was like ballot. But for Trump all doesn't even understand that. that. All he cared about was the certification of the election. He doesn't oh. care about anything else, and and I Kemp didn't do what he wanted. No, could care. He doesn't even know where it is. But Kemp yeah. didn't do what he wanted, so now he hates him, and he has crabs. Exactly. Thanks. Allegedly, allegedly <laughs> has crabs. Anyway, um, so look, we're we're gonna have to see. I I would assume that it will be Kemp that's gonna run. Maybe there will be some kind of contested primary. Um, you never know from messages like this from Trump. How dead set he is on actually trying to take out that Republican. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, but it's going to be a difficult race no matter what. It's still an incredibly close state. And that yeah. is assuming that people actually turn out and are able to actually vote. And there are reasons to believe that neither of those things might happen. So Trump's, we'll Trump's be anger at this. Kemp will, will only last as long as uh, Kemp needs to go and kiss his ring, and then that'll be it. Then he'll Which be he'll fine. do. Which he'll do. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. So we'll be watching this and we'll see. We'll we'll try to get Stacey Abrams on the show. So good yes. luck with that. <laughs> uh, retweet that tweet later on. Anyway, uh, if you've been watching our linear platforms, thank you so much for that. But if you're on the members app or YouTube or Twitch, we do have a lot more news. So don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break. If you do go somewhere, go go retweet that thing, and then we'll be back after this.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.